Hi, welcome to Kips's IT Professionalism Week podcast. I'm Jonathan Elias, the Marketing Manager at Kips National. And on the call today, we have Brenda Byers, the Chair of the Kips National Board and member of Kips Saskatchewan, Jeff Netchel, the President of Kips Ontario, and Pat Glenn, the President of Kips Alberta. Uh, this week is IT Professionalism Week, which is running from Monday, February 2nd to Friday, February 6th. And IT Professionalism Week is a yearly celebration held by KIPS across Canada to increase the awareness and about the importance of professionalism in the IT industry today. Uh, for more information about IT Professionalism Week, please visit cips.ca slash IT Professionalism Week. And you can also view the events that are happening across the country at cips.ca slash events. Uh, on today's podcast, we'll discuss uh, defining an IT professional. Uh, we'll ask if IT is a developed profession and also discuss how an IT professional can develop their skills and careers. So Brenda, Jeff, how, Pat, how are you all doing? Great. 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 Well, appreciate you all uh, being on the podcast today. So, uh, I think I'm going to start with uh, Brenda asking, uh, Brenda, how uh, would you define an IT professional? Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, just before also we get started, I'd like to welcome all of our KIPS members and maybe non-KIPS members who are listening in as well. And it's wonderful to actually bring to the forefront the IT industry and professionalism and ethics. And I'd like to thank Jonathan for organizing this for us. And for sure, how do you define an IT professional? And for me, it's definitely someone who works in the field of IT, computer science, software systems engineering, and has education and experience in these disciplines as well. So it is a very broad industry, and it's ever growing larger. And the specialization in the industry as well is continuously changing and so I'd like to um, really um, I guess expand what we talk about sometimes when we refer to IT and uh, hopefully this call will actually help to uh, expand people's knowledge of the different domains so that's how I would define it Jonathan. Hey great thanks Brenda. Uh, Jeff, Pat anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that, uh, that that Brenda Brenda definitely has it. It's the it's the uh, education and the experience that uh, that go into that. Um, you know, information technology in general is is unregulated, so it's not as clean cut as uh, as some other uh, uh, areas. But you know, professionals are people who um, uh, are not just out in a in a job in the uh, in the industry. They're looking for a People that self-identify, I guess, as a professional because they they have a career, not a, not a job uh, in the industry, and they they take uh, uh, the work that they do uh, seriously in terms of um, uh, knowing when when they can do something and knowing when they can't, or should uh, look for other uh, uh, experience before they before they dive into a project. I guess I would. Um add a couple of things and, and also perhaps pose a bit of a, a question at the end. Um, certainly agree with what has been said and um, I sort of agree to the, the point that it's a person who's obtained education and experience. Also probably a little add a little nuance to that is that it's not just education and experience, it's what you gain in terms of knowledge and skills to actually perform the role of the, the profession. And that's, I guess, applying what you are learning into something that uh, will move the project that you're working on forward with your competency um, being brought to the table. And it's also a person that adheres to professional standard and a code of ethics. But to the, the point of, of being regulated, I, I think the that is a, a little bit open to debate. I think those um, provinces that have a professional designation registered, certainly in our province, that is very, very similar to the regulated um, groups such as engineers and doctors and lawyers. Our legislation um, requires 
almost the same kinds of things that it does for the, the legislation for a particular profession. So, Professor, are, are you uh, saying that you think that IT should be regulated? Well, in Alberta, they consider it to be regulated, actually. Um, we're not licensed. And the reason for that, given at the time, was that the government of the day considered licensing to be a barrier to entry to work. But um, the Alberta government considers those professions and organizations that are registered under the Professional Occupations Registration Act to be regulated. And we have the ability and the requirement to take away the ISP from a person if warranted. I was just talking to them the other day and they said everybody that is is uh, registered under that act is considered to be regulated by the province. And uh, for those listening that aren't uh, familiar with KIPS, um, you know, the ISP uh, is uh, KIPS's professional IT certification. Um, and uh, it is the only uh, legally recognized IT professional designation uh, in Canada in um, most of the provinces, including uh, Alberta. Um, so, you know, I guess in, in, in terms of, you know, that respect of um, being able to look at the ISP and, and uh, you know, regulate whether someone should be able to hold the ISP, um, you know, I definitely see how it could be viewed as a regulated profession uh, in that respect. Um, I guess it's more open to debate for, um, you know, those IT professionals who don't hold the ISP or even KIPS's ITCP uh, designation. And, um, you know, I think there would be maybe some who would argue that, uh, you know, IT is, is not yet a regulated profession. And in some degree, maybe it's not um, a developed profession just because it, it is so vague about what an IT professional is. Um, so I know, I guess, you know, can you speak to, you know, where the, the IT profession is at and, and perhaps, you know, where it needs to go just because, um, you know, it is to some degree vague, but IT is becoming uh, a crucial part of all aspects of business. Um, and, you know, that regulation in, you know, outside of KIPS is a little bit more gray. Yeah, I think, I think just, to, uh, just to add a, a finer point, um, so I, I guess, I guess the, the real uh, discussion is the, is the fine point between regulated and uh, and licensed, um, and the, because you know, as in Alberta, uh, the ISP is recognized in Ontario and you know by provincial statute. Um, so I guess in that sense, it definitely is 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 regulated. The, the government uh, the government observes it, um, but it is not a um, uh, you know it, it is often preferred uh, in, in some cases preferred by, by employers, but uh, uh, not uh, not a a uh, requirement because of the, the barrier to entry uh, issues that that uh, Pat mentioned. And and Jonathan, this is Brenda here. Just to make a point, um, and you talked a little bit about how uh, the perception generally is that there are um, n not, I guess, good definitions of of the IT professional and the specializations. And I think, unfortunately, external to the industry, I think that could potentially be true. But within the industry, I assure you that professionals definitely can define their area of specialization, their area of the profession. And um, for example, if, if you were to ask an IT professional uh, what type of IT professional they are, they would very clearly be able to list, you know, I'm an infrastructure specialist, I'm a network specialist, I'm a DBA, I'm a programmer. There's no doubt in their mind they know their area of discipline. And I think it's just a matter of us as an industry educating the public and potentially even educating some of our provincial leaders and federal leaders of those different disciplines and that, um, you know, the, the IT guy is long gone in the industry and there's definitely areas of specialization and, and roles defined within the industry that are very clearly understood. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, I guess because of that, like, various spe specialization, um, you know, would you say it's, it's because of that it's been hard to, um, you know, define just a general IT professional? Um, and comparing to, you know, say, you know, the professional engineers and their PNG designation, which, 
um, essentially encompasses the, the pro professional engineers? Well, you know, our, our really the ISP and the certification that KIPS delivers is that similar type of overarching designation that covers all those areas of specialization. And, uh, you know, I think, again, um, maybe there's not enough clarity of that definition of really what that um, designation does provide, and it, it, it is a validation of that professional's education and experience. And, you know, it will almost always be in an area of specialization mm -hmm. that um, that person has achieved in the industry. And there may be more than one. Um, certainly as a person moves through their career and, um, you know, through their, their life within the industry, they are obtaining additional specializations as they grow, very much like any other profession. Uh, you might even change your specialization as you move through your career. And, you know, you see a lot of that as well, that someone is growing into the either the leadership roles or uh, maybe a chief uh, architect type role uh, within an IT organization. And that requires many different areas of specialization. So it, it's a very, it, it is very complex and I think that's maybe part of the problem is that people really, um, unless you're in the industry and you're exposed to it all the time, you don't really, that literature isn't out there describing those different domains within the industry. Yeah. Now, Pat, I know uh, KIPS Alberta um, has uh, recently um, been doing some projects uh, using uh, SOFIA, which is a, a framework uh, it's defining various specializations. Um, and essentially, I know for the, the ITCP, those are, are based on Sophia, um, you know, I guess essentially looking at a few of those different specializations to define uh, an overall uh, skill level uh, to equate to that uh, overall uh, designation. Um, you know, do, you, do you think that maybe perhaps the ITCP and the ISP uh, could be that link to look at those specializations um, and uh, I guess just to find that overall IT professional for those uh, who aren't in IT and, and aren't really familiar with all the various uh, specializations in different areas? Well, I was just thinking those, along those lines as Brenda spoke. Um, very definitely the SOFIA, the Skills Framework for the Information Age, which um, actually is now used in 195 countries, so it's going gaining global recognition, uh, does define things like um, architects and network specialists and developers and business analysts. So many of the uh, people that work in the, in the sector uh, will find that their skills um, are defined in that framework and then within that there are various levels. Um, some levels, if you're at the strategic management level, you don't have any levels one and two, and other ones at the bottom as you enter the industry have levels one and two and not at, uh, at the higher levels. But it is, I, I think there's about 96 descriptions of people working in various subsectors, if you will, or um, specialties and then the levels within that so it um, it certainly comes close to that and it's updated on a relatively regular basis so that it keeps in tune with what uh, is required for an IT professional to work in business. Great, thanks Pat. Um, I guess maybe just to, to switch uh, gears just uh, a little bit, um, Jeff, could you maybe provide some insights on like why you think that professionalism and ethics is needed in the IT industry? Yeah, well, I think that um, uh, if, if, if the IT industry is becoming more global, um, you know, I think that uh, for Canada to be able to uh, compete, uh, you know, we, we need to have a have, have really solid output of, uh, uh, you know, uh, quality product from quality resources. I think that um, certainly ethics is a uh, hiring managers um, uh, and uh, uh, HR professionals are all um, 
uh, have been asking, you know, more and more. I've been hearing as ethics as a as a key component of um, the type of worker that they're trying to um, attract to their organizations. Uh, I know that HR, as they have the HR uh, profession, has uh, created their own similar code of ethics. Um, uh, that uh, the KIPS has uh, a little bit different uh, statement, but um, uh, there are similarities to be drawn. Um, there, there is a greater interest in attracting people with um, uh, with with strong a strong sense of ethics. You know, people who will uh, tell you when they can actually do the work um, in a uh, in a professional manner and not uh, uh, kind of. Uh, Bluster, bluster through it only to create a, a disaster project at the end. So, you know, we need this. We need this to develop good products within the country, but also to be known internationally for uh, a country that can uh, uh, produce uh, highly skilled workers. That workers can that can be defined uh, as being highly skilled and as being um, uh, ethical in what they do. So, I think that it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's essential not only for the not only for the country's domestic um, production of, uh, of of software and, uh, and other IT uh, artifacts, um, but uh, internationally as well. And Brenda, Pat, how about yourself? Is, um, you know, do you think that it's urgent that you know uh, Canada really adopts a, a mindset of improving the professionalism and ethics in the IT industry? Well, you know, Jonathan, uh, this is this is Brenda here, and it, it actually ties very closely into your one of the previous questions around, you know, is IT a profession? And one of the components, or some of the components, I guess, of a you know officially defined profession is a code of ethics and a body of knowledge, um, you know, education and curriculum and certainly standards of practice, certification, and accreditation. So there are many aspects to defining a profession, and ethics is a large part of that. And so uh, it's worth noting that, you know, obviously KIPS has a code of ethics and must now test its members on the understanding and, I guess, acceptance of that code of ethics. And that is part of our uh, designations and the recertification of our members. They must comply with the Code of Ethics and be tested on the Code of Ethics. So it is a big part of it. And I'm thinking moving into the future, it will become more of a demand from employers and from the public in general. And I always kind of scoff that, you know, we... You know, the ISP and ITCP hasn't grown acceptance as much in Canada. And I blame it on the industry being very ethical currently. Um, IT professionals, it's very common for them to have very high levels of clearance to data within a corporation. Um, and with lots of new privacy legislation, it is, I guess, becoming more popular that not only are IT professionals getting uh, security designations, but they have to understand the privacy regulations. So again, another area of specialization, but it is an area of specialization that must be understood across all levels of uh, an IT department. So um, that being said, I think there is a growing need for more training in ethics, and we're seeing um, exposures of and, and breach of data within organizations through either external hackers or and or potentially internal issues um, with uh, ethics and uh, code of uh, practice and behavior. So, um, you know, I really think there's going to be more pressure on the IT industry to validate um, that level of ethics and uh, professionalism. And, you know, that's where KIPS can really help the industry um, you know, uh, I guess validate uh, those IT professionals that are being hired. Yeah. 
If you look at, uh, you know, the equivalent to KIPPS, um, you know, whether it's the British Computer Society or the Australian Computer Society, um, you know, let's be honest, like those are huge societies and, and um, you know, clearly they have got a lot of buy-in from their IT professionals. Um, you know, even though KIPPS um, has uh, many similar items and uh, has developed their IT professional designations and their code of ethics, um, you know, and networking events and, and various professionalism uh, initiatives that are always going on across the country. You know, why do you think that you know in, in Canada there hasn't been the same adoption for an IT professional society uh, to the extent that the Australian Computer Society and British British Computer Society are? I think um, if I can speak to that, one of the the things that uh, is different in in the two countries is the um, way that they actually work with their national government. Uh, The ACS is uh, given an awful lot of work by the government for assessing immigrants coming into the country. They're um, given the the task of integrating immigrants and students who have, foreign students who have trained at Australian universities. So those are two examples of how they work with them. And then again, the BCS and coming up with SOFIA, that was partly an initiative uh, certainly supported by the, the UK government. So I think that if you have a lot more recognition by your national government, and then that can work down into the provincial governments on the, the um, national programs that go across the country. If we, if we had better recognition there, I think that that would spread out into industry an awful lot easier and be much more accepted. So what type of things you know, can, can we do in Canada to, you know, I guess, get the, the government more behind uh, you know, the IT professional societies and help develop them to the extent that our, you know, the British and Australian counterparts have done? Well, I think we just have to build a really good, strong relationship um, with the government of Canada. And so we become the go-to society when uh, the government is looking at anything dealing with the ICT professional and the professional within the sector. Um, you know, it, it, we just haven't, uh, we have had that at various times in our uh, life of, of well over 50 years and it, um, it kind of waxes and wanes, I, I think partly on uh, behalf of the government and partly on behalf of, of KIPS and the, the interest of, of people. We run very much as, um, as a volunteer organization and when you look at the volunteers and what they can do compared to sort of substantial paid uh, staff in both the UK and Australia, it is. It certainly is a little different, and um, we have to figure out how to operate in a way that would allow us to build and sustain those relationships. And I guess what one aspect of, of that is, you know, trying to get IT professionals aware that there are associations like KIPS, and you know, to support those associations, um, so that you know they become you know big enough and have enough of a voice that they can convince, uh, you know, the government to support uh, IIT professional initiatives, um, you know, like KIPS does across the country. Um, I guess, you know, just, you know, looking away from the association side of it, um, if we're looking at the, you know, individual IIT professional, uh, you know, what steps can they take for their own career growth and development? Um, and, you know, you know, do whatever they can to make them, you know, considered a, a professional and act, um, you know, in, in the highest, uh, you know, ethics and, and professional development uh, as possible. Um, I can speak to that, Jonathan, and really, obviously, first the first step is education and um, enrolling themselves in um, an accredited IT education or CompSci, and um, as you know, KIPS provides um, accreditation all across Canada and now internationally for uh, programs that would qualify for that KIPS accreditation. 
so education is number one. Um, I think number two, obviously, is uh, experience and uh, determining your area of specialization. And it's you know very much like any other career development. The uh, students themselves are already starting to uh, choose those specializations through the classes they take in their programs. But you know definitely that um, experience is you know a, a very critical step into that evolution of the professional. And then you know as they start to obtain that experience, that's where they can begin to start developing um, certifications, either vendor or non-certification, um, vendor certifications, in order to validate the experience that they've obtained in the industry. And then as they move through their career, obviously there's continuous learning. And I mean, that is one thing that I don't think is unique to the IT industry, but certainly is critical to uh, a career development is continuous learning because of the you know constant change in the industry the professional must continue to learn to grow and understand the trends in the industry and then uh, grow their their areas of specialization depending on the need of the industry so to me that that's kind of a I guess uh, a closed loop that um, KIPP certainly would help it, the industry achieve is ensuring that the programs that are, are bringing students in to the industry are delivering what the industry needs and are also keeping up with the technology advancements and uh, ensuring that the, the right education is, is getting put in front of uh, students and uh, basically uh, practitioners as well as they go through their careers. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I think, um, uh, you know, in my in my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, career, um, uh, I, I encounter, I guess, uh, it's over-indexed on, on software developers and software architects. And, uh, uh, those type of um, specialists, but um, it, it sometimes amazes me um, how often uh, you know uh, people that are coming in for an interview for a, for a specific position will not really have um, thought too deeply about. Um, I mean, they, they may be competent at, at their work, they may be skilled programmers, but have not really thought about um, the industry and their place within it. Um, and uh, uh, you know about what uh, a, a true mature industry, um, uh, what elements a true mature industry would have. So, just a candidate who is able to think about um, the industry, their place in it, um, ethics, standards of practice, uh, immediately sets them apart um, from other candidates. Certainly, in my eyes, but uh, I'm sure not just my eyes. Um, it, it's it's uh, uh, you know just putting 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 thought to the your position in the universe <laughs> uh, is uh, uh, just just that step is, is a very very important uh, important step. I think one of. Uh you know the the pieces of the puzzle, uh, you know, for like, career growth and development can be, uh, you know, joining professional associations. Um, so you know, I guess open up this question to all of you. Uh, you know, what value do you see in professional associations? Um, and you can also talk about the experiences that you've had in being, uh, you know, associated and part of KIPS. Um, you know, what value you've gained from KIPS, and also I guess contributing to KIPS and and the initiatives that that um, you know, you've been a part of. Uh, Jonathan, I can start that off. You know, I, I, as current chair of the national board, just the exposure to IT professionals all across Canada and also the academic community um, across Canada in the industry, it's been, I guess, a certainly a, a learning experience for me, but also 
growth and development of leadership and managerial type of skills is been a huge part of you know the growth in my career and often people think of the um, IT industry and the practitioners within it as people who don't require good communication skills or good presentation skills and that could be as far from the truth as um, absolutely it could be because it's a constant uh, pressure on the IT professional for good communication and communicating with influence and presenting their ideas and their recommendations for solutions. And it, it really does go on and on. The, the level of connection with other people, other stakeholders, industry and vendors and suppliers, those are all areas of IT a lot of people don't think about, uh, but it's very true. So what um, you know, KIPS as an organization can provide that leadership growth, communication skill growth, and all kinds of professional development from um, an IT practitioner perspective. So, I mean, that's part of it, um, but it also provides networking um, ability to connect with local, other local practitioners, and often can help with job search and uh, job placement and references and all those things that are required um, to have a healthy career in the IT industry. Uh, but I also mentioned certification and accreditation of programs to help the industry validate the quality programs that are out there and being delivered by academic institutions all across Canada. So, uh, you know, I could probably speak for hours, Jonathan, just on, on the benefits of an association and some of the roles that it could play. And I'm, I'm sure the others on the call, Jeff and Pat, could speak to that as well. Sure. I, I, think, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I've, 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 I've been involved with KIPS now for, for more than 10 years, and uh, I guess I've been on the executive uh, of some KIPS entity uh, for probably only three months less than the entire time that I've been involved with KIPS. Um, you know, like 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 uh, anything in life, um, you get out of an organization what you put into it. Uh, I think that um, uh, you know it, it, it is an invaluable um, uh, mechanism to go and uh, explore areas of, of the industry from which you're unfamiliar with uh, to uh, develop relationships and trust with people. And you know, the best way to do that is uh, uh, you know when you're volunteering. Um, with an organization, to be able to work side by side with somebody allows um, them to see your character through the work. Um, I think this is uh, uh, something that um, you know anyone sort of intuitively knows. If you if someone asks you for a, uh, a recommendation or a, uh, something of that sort, uh, and you've worked with them for a very long period of time, you probably won't hesitate because you'll know their character. You'll know. Um, what that person is all about through the work, um, and normally that's limited to only places where you've worked before. So for uh, uh, people starting out in the industry or people who want to get a, a broader uh, exposure to the industry, um, you know, a professional organization is, is, is where you get that done. It is uh, uh, you know, quintessential, quintessential part of the, of the value is, uh, is what you do. And obviously, um, if not, uh, you know, active volunteering, at least, um, uh, you know, active attendance and participation in the various events that uh, that the organization has. I certainly agree with what has been said, and they've covered uh, an awful lot of points, so I'll try not to, well, I won't be redundant to that. But just a couple of other points. One is I think that uh, professional associations can really do a lot to furthering the profession. And what I mean by that is including what is part of the profession and getting that information out um, to the public. 
And in speaking um, of the public, it can also protect the public. I mean, that is um, a key component of our standards of practice and our code of ethics is to protect the public from poor design and implementation and uh, operation of I information technology programs or information and communication technology programs. So I think that that is, is another thing that the professional societies um, provide, as well as um, is just looking after the interests of those that are currently in the profession and how they want to maintain a professional status, how they want to be part of a profession. So I think those are things that the professional association, association can do. Oh, and the, the final thing on that is it um, is also um, they can build affiliations with related societies that uh, can't necessarily be done too effectively on a, an individual basis, and that can be done on a, a local, provincial, national, and international level, which is beneficial to the professional working in, the, in that sector. Hey, wonderful. Well, uh, Brenda, you know, Jeff and Pat, uh, you know, we'll end this podcast uh, shortly. Uh, but, you know, be quickly before we do, um, are there any, you know, projects or initiatives that you can talk about that your, uh, you know, KIPS province is taking or even any national initiatives that you've been part of? I can certainly talk about what Alberta is doing, but I just want to bring up one other point um, and probably should have brought it up in in the last point, when I was working internationally and could use the ISP and the ITCP, they didn't know what it was in the country I was working in, but when I explained it, it brought an awful lot of credibility to Canada and to me, uh, to Canada that they had those designations and to me that I had attained them. So uh, I think we should be really very cognizant of the importance that the ISP and the ITCP are on an international on an international basis. In terms of the project um, and initiatives in Alberta, I've mentioned earlier that we've been talking about implementing SOFIA. We are implementing it now. We are assessing our members and it is um, free to members. It's a value of membership. And in the fall, we will start assessing non-members for a fee. Uh, we're working with the province right now on developing a proposal for the provincial government in using SOFIA for the assessment of people who want to immigrate to Alberta and then um, after they are here or the ones that are already here using SOFIA to define their competency which will help them integrate with the workforce in Alberta. Thanks Pat. And to your point about uh, you know, KIPS's influence internationally um, you know, perhaps uh, you know Brenda can add a bit more to that because I know uh, you know Brenda has been to um, you know international conferences uh, representing KIPS. Um, so it'd be you know good for our listeners to hear you know how the rest of the world views KIPS. Well, you know, and it's it's not even so much um, KIPS, but it's it's Canada and the Canadian ICT industry in general is actually perceived as one of the mature industries, I guess, within the world. And I, I think, again, there's not a, a high awareness of that level of appreciation and uh, recognition, I guess, within the world IT uh, industry that Canada is one of the leading areas in maturity and certainly defining the components of an IT profession. There are many countries that don't right now even have member organizations like KIPS. Um, if there has been a history in, in technology, it's often very much regulated by the government and only now is being handed back to the hands of the members and there's enough now members and practitioners within some of those countries to be able to develop the maturity of uh, implementation of frameworks and maturity of processes within IT departments uh, to be able to regulate and, and govern its, itself um, as, a, as an IT industry. So, you know, Canada is definitely looked at to provide guidance 
and direction for our co the countries that are developing their technology industry, and an opinion is respected um, in in the IT industry, and that's why uh, KIPS is important as uh, representing Canada at organizations such as IFIP and IP3 and uh, organizations such as the Soul Accord that is um, accrediting um, organizations like KIPS um, all across the world and, and in uh, the areas that they're responsible for. So there are many international organizations, many of which KIPS is a founding member for. And, you know, I think there um, is, I guess, a better, I think, appreciation for the maturity and uh, the connection Canada has internationally, internationally, then um, it, there's a better understanding and awareness than um, I think nationally. And uh, I think we should probably do a lot more to promote the um, exposure that Canada has in the international organizations such as IFIP, which is the International Federation of Information professionals. So, very good. And uh, in terms of uh, you know local uh, initiatives going on in in uh, Kip Saskatchewan or, or Kips Ontario, um, you know Jeff and Brenda, can you speak to those? Um, you know whether it be you know uh, mentorship opportunities or um, I know Kips uh, volunteers will do presentations at. Uh, the local college and universities um, to get students thinking about you know the IIT profession um, and what they can do for their professional career. Yeah, in, in Ontario, certainly um, our our uh, mentoring program is uh, uh, has been active um, in providing uh, uh, linking mentors with um, uh, you know mentees that are just coming out of university. Um, or our uh, new uh, new Canadians, and actually, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, uh, we have um, the uh, actually the, the inverse problem with many mentor programs, in which we have many many mentors and not not, not a sufficient number of uh, mentees who are uh, uh, queuing up just to, to balance that out. But but we have been active in um, uh, in, uh, uh, in in pairing uh, mentors and mentees, and, and that is an important. Yeah, that's pretty interesting though that there's uh, you know more mentors than, than mentees as you, as you said. Um, I guess that's another aspect of you know Kips is a, a great resource you know as, as Brenda said internationally, but then uh, locally as well. I guess just the the uh, struggle there is you know getting the word out that there are associations like Kips that can help um, you know new IT professionals or you know, professionals that have been in, in their career for a few years but are looking to develop. Um, so you know, I guess it's always the challenge is just trying to get out the word that there are these opportunities, um, you know, whether it be KIPS or other professional associations, um, and that IT professionals should look at that resource. Um, where I know I know back, you know previously, uh, many years ago, uh, you know KIPS uh, used to have a, a big influence locally in that um, IT professionals would um, you know attend uh, events, um, in person events, anyways. Uh, but now there has been, you know, more of a trend to uh, online events and um, online webinars. Um, but I guess, you know, there there still must be uh, a lot that an IT professional can take away from attending, um, you know, in person events um, like you know the events that are actually going on all across the country for IT Professionalism Week. Um, so, you know, perhaps before we end this podcast, could you, you know, quickly speak about what benefits uh, you all have got from attending these in-person events, um, you know, that are held every month across the country? Um, this is Brenda here. I also, yes, um, I just want to, um, I guess, compliment the provinces um, for delivering their strong programs. And I'm 
as you mentioned, from Kip, Saskatchewan. So we have a very strong program here, and they deliver, the programming committee for Kip, Saskatchewan delivers a luncheon event um, in both Saskatoon and Regina every month through the uh, term, through, um, I, I guess it would be August through till June of each year. So, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, for our members to attend. But, I mean, some of the, I guess, benefits of attending um, in person is that networking and the actual, um, I guess, connection with not only students in the industry, which we often get here in Saskatchewan, we get many student attendees, but also very senior people within the IT industry, and it's a great opportunity to talk to people, meet people, and get connected, but also academics. We, we get a number of academics who are heads of um, programs that are being delivered. So, I mean, that, that networking um, is just, I mean, there's just no other way um, that, you know, you can get that um, face-to-face uh, especially for a new person starting out in the industry. Um, that being said, I mean, the reason and the main objectives for luncheons and um, dinner events is education and professional development. And, you know, those speakers are delivering some sort of, uh, a, you know, growth um, training for that practitioner. So, I mean, that is the ultimate goal of those events is to deliver uh, learning and education to members. So, I mean, that's just a small part, I guess, of, of what an association can do, but it's a very large part at the, on a local level of have, giving the members an opportunity to connect with each other and to um, give that uh, professional development opportunity, which, as you mentioned, is also becoming more and more online. So that's another growth area. Uh, within the industry is, you know, obviously um, members having the ability to get resources uh, online, either through webcasts or podcasts like this, and uh, presentations that have been recorded and that sort of thing. So it's it's definitely a growing area. I uh, just uh. uh <laughs> There's not many points left, Brenda, after that uh, good description of why you should go to events. I think one thing is the um, person-to-person interactive dialogue in terms of the questions um, that come out of the, the presentation have always been a, a particular value. But also, uh, KIPS in Alberta is now doing webinars on most of um, the events out of Calgary just because we have the equipment in Calgary at the moment, but we also serve the Northwest Territory, so that allows um, people in more remote places in Alberta and in the Northwest Territories to participate in the KIPS Alberta events. Yeah, I mean, geography has always been a, a challenge. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ontario is uh, uh, planning to experiment with in the spring is to uh, combine the, the webinar and in-person formats and hold a uh, central webinar, but then hold um, uh, sort of uh, viewing events in uh, relatively isolated areas. Try to encourage members that uh, uh, you know live live in uh, reasonable proximity from each other to, to get together and, and meet and uh, watch the event uh, uh, as a group, so that some some face-to-face networking can happen, and that group can. Uh, uh, you know, be in contact with the, uh, the, the webinar uh, host location to feed in questions and so forth. So this is uh, uh, sort of uh, on the on the spring spring time frame experimental radar for, for Toronto. Wonderful. Um, so. I think we will wrap up uh, this podcast, uh, but before we do, you know, I'd personally just like to, you know, thank you all, Brenda, Jeff, and Pat, for not only you know uh, giving your time for this podcast, but for you know all the time um, and effort that you've contributed to Kips uh, over the years, and and really to Canada's IT professional community. Um, you know, it's the the time from volunteers uh, like yourselves uh, to grow the IT profession for the IT professional and 
and the uh, profession as a whole uh, is is crucial and it is greatly needed. So, uh, you know, thank you for for everything that you do for Kips and and the IT community. Well, thank I, you for the opportunity of letting us share it. <laughs> yes, thanks, Jonathan, for all the work you. you do too. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and for those uh, that are listening, uh, if you'd like for more information about KIPS, uh, our membership or certifications, accreditation of college and university programs, uh, you can find more information at www.cips.ca or you can also send an email to info at cips.ca. All right. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Take you. care.